Hello, this is Chris Young, and welcome to episode 15 of Contemplating Life. This week we begin a multi-part series recounting my days in a special education school here in Indianapolis. In the mid-1930s, Indianapolis Public Schools built James E. Roberts School No. 97. It was especially designed for handicapped children and was in many ways in response to the polio epidemic. It was at the corner of East 10th and Oriental Streets on the near east side near Arsenal Technical High School. The two-story Art Deco building featured ramps, an elevator, and a physical therapy department with a small swimming pool. Students from kindergarten through high school were educated there for 50 years. The school closed at the end of the 1985-86 school year. All of the kids, except the most severely multiply handicapped kids, were mainstreamed into regular schools. After Roberts closed, it was used for a variety of purposes for a few years and was considered a candidate for demolition. However, given its history, there were efforts to preserve the building. It was renovated into an apartment building and now is known as the Roberts School of Flats. In episode six, I told the story how my mother tried to enroll me in St. Christopher Parish School. They really weren't equipped to deal with a disabled kid, so I was enrolled in Roberts School Kindergarten in 1960 at the age of five. Just prior to that, in the summer of 60, my parents purchased my first wheelchair. Prior to that, they would just carry me around. Most of the day, I would sit in a small chair at our coffee table in the living room where I'd play with toys, eat bologna sandwiches for lunch, and watch TV. At dinner time, I would sit in a high chair at the dining room table. The IPS schools operated 10 school buses at the time, and all of them were used to transport children from all over Indianapolis to Robert's School. In those days, there was no busing of children to any other school for any reason, such as to achieve racial integration. Kids either walked to school or were transported by their parents to their local neighborhood schools. There were probably seven or eight high schools, and I don't know how many junior high or middle schools. Robert's buses were stationed at the school and were occasionally used for field trips by other schools. The Eagledale neighborhood where I lived was in the far northwest corner of the city, and initially there was no bus route to reach me. They hired an eight-passenger taxi cab to pick up several of us in my neighborhood. The cab driver, or perhaps my mother, I don't recall which, would lift me out of my wheelchair and into the taxi. When we arrived at the school, the driver would pick me up and transfer me to a wheelchair that belonged to the school. There was a girl several years older than me named Erica who lived near here but was just outside the IPS boundaries. I believe she had cerebral palsy, although she could walk with difficulty. She persuaded the school to allow her to attend, but they would not cross city limits to pick her up. The family member would drive her to my house, and they would sit in the car and wait until the taxi arrived, and then she would join us. I don't know how long I rode the taxi, but I don't think it was for the entire year of kindergarten. At some point, they got a new bus, or they rerouted an existing bus to handle the northwest side. It was an ordinary school bus, with the only accommodation being safety belts. The bus driver would lift me out of my home wheelchair and into the school wheelchair upon arrival and reverse the process at the end of the day. Among the people who rode that bus with me for many years were Chris Fryman, who was my age, and Carol Brummett, who was about four years older than me. Chris had osteogenesis imperfecta, most commonly known as brittle bone disease. He used a wheelchair, and he had his legs in braces, mostly to protect them from breaking. 
Carol had contracted polio and spent some time in an iron rung and had minimal use of her arms and legs. They both rode the bus with me the entire 13 years I attended it. Well, of course, Carol graduated before I did. Also, my good friend Mark Herring, who had a form of muscular dystrophy and was a few years younger than me, lived right around the corner on 32nd Street. He also rode the bus with me for many years. I'll talk more about him in later episodes. One of the interesting things about the population of Robert's school was how it reflected the impact of the Sork vaccine for polio. That vaccine became available in the summer I was born, in 1955. If you look to my classmates, more than half of the people older than me were there because of polio. Absolutely no one my age or younger had polio. It was like somebody just flipped a switch and the disease disappeared. Not all of the kids in Robert's school were in wheelchairs. Some, such as those with mild cerebral palsy, could walk, perhaps with, with crutches. Others had asthma, like my friend Ted Hayes, or a heart condition, such as Lily Odinger. A few had epilepsy. Many of them probably didn't need to be segregated into a special education school. It seemed that any medical condition that a child had that the average school nurse didn't want to deal with would get them sent off to our special school. Anyone in the school who was not in a wheelchair was referred to as a walker. I mentioned that I used a wheelchair that was provided by the school. That doesn't mean that IPS purchased the wheelchairs. There was little or no extra funding for special education. The wheelchairs had either been donated or had been purchased by the PTA. Every year we held a cookie sale, and the proceeds went to purchase wheelchairs and other equipment. It seems as though the attitude at IPS was, hey, we built you a special school, what more do you want? My first wheelchair at Roberts was nothing more than a child-sized wooden chair nailed to a plank with four small caster wheels and a handle on the back. I had to be pushed everywhere. It didn't have large wheels that I could push with my hands. My standard child's wheelchair that my parents had purchased did have large rear wheels, and if I was on a completely smooth, flat surface, I could push myself a few inches with great difficulty. The kindergarten was a large room, complete with its own dedicated restroom, a piano for music class, a TV set, something that now the other classrooms in the building had, and lots of wooden blocks and other toys. We used to watch Captain Kangaroo on the TV every morning. For those of you who don't know what that is, he was sort of an early version of Mr. Rogers. The teacher was a wonderful woman named Miss Helen Martin. I'm pretty sure she was still teaching at the kindergarten when I graduated. After lunch, she and one of the custodians would set up a bunch of cots, and we would spend most of the afternoon in nap time. Considering that many kindergarten classes are only half a day, spending the other half of the day trying to nap was not unreasonable. The problem was everyone in the school had at least one hour of nap time after lunch. I don't think it went all the way to the high school level, but it did go through junior high, which meant 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. We'll talk about nap time more in the next episode. When a kid first enrolls in school, it's typical for your family, especially your grandma, your aunt, your great aunts, to ask, have you got a girlfriend yet? Apparently, they never heard of puberty and don't realize those kinds of concerns aren't a priority for several years. Still, I received a lot of pressure to answer that question. It seems that my classmate, Cheryl, 
was receiving similar pressure from her family to find a boyfriend. So, although we were both clueless as to what that relationship involved, we agreed to be boyfriend and girlfriend. Cheryl was born with no arms. She had tiny appendages, perhaps three inches long, each of which had two tiny fingers. Throughout our grade school years, we would frequently get visitors in the building. They were typically nursing students or special education teaching students. Upon seeing Cheryl, you would hear the word thalidomide whispered. The infamous drug thalidomide was prescribed to women in the early and mid-1950s as a very effective method of combating morning sickness during pregnancy. The problem was it caused severe birth defects in many cases, most often missing limbs. The visitors naturally assumed that thalidomide was the cause of Cheryl's condition. Decades later, I saw a documentary about the drug, and then I did some research about it on my own. As best I can tell, it was never used in the United States, and it was completely discontinued in 1954. I was born in 1955, as presumably was Cheryl, unless her mother was Canadian or European, and was unfortunate enough to have taken the drug just before it was pulled from the market, her condition was not caused by thalidomide. Sometimes birth defects just happen. Anyway, one day we were sitting at the table coloring. I was about to complete my masterpiece. An airplane was flying over houses, complete with white fluffy clouds and a smiling sun in the sky. Cheryl was sitting on top of the same table that I was using. She was drawing with a crayon between her toes. For reasons I never understood, probably my fault somehow, she reached over and scribbled all over my drawing. I was furious. When I tried to retaliate, she pulled her paper away from me where I couldn't reach it. Now I was even more furious because she was exploiting my disability, or rather my inability to climb up on the table and scribble on her paper. I took that extremely personally. A nasty argument ensued. I don't know for certain who went there first, but I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and say that I was the one that took the argument to the extreme that I'm about to describe. I said, I don't want to be your boyfriend anymore. Well, good. I don't want to be your girlfriend anymore. I don't think anybody will ever want to be your boyfriend because you can't hug them or hold hands because you got no arms. So, you're, you're never going to get married because you're in a wheelchair and you can't walk down the aisle. At that point, Miss Martin rushed over to intervene and broke up the fight. Looking back at the incident, I find it fascinating how it illustrated a five-year-old's concept of the male-female relationship. For the boy, it consisted of hugging and holding hands, and the girl was already anticipating marriage. Although James E. Roberts' school was built with a physical therapy department, ramps, and an elevator to accommodate our special needs, the reason most of us were there was allegedly to protect us from the cruelty we would encounter from other students because of our disabilities. This incident, and many others I could recount, illustrates that we were more normal than they thought. We could be just as cruel to one another regarding our disabilities as if we were integrated into a regular education setting with able children. Cheryl left Roberts for a couple of years, but I never knew why. When she returned, she was a year behind me. At one point, she was fitted with artificial arms, but they really never were worth the effort for her. She was very adept at using her feet. 
by the time she reached junior high, like most walkers, she moved on to a regular school. When I was in my early 20s, I saw a newspaper feature article about her. The accompanying photo showed her sitting at a desk at her office job, typing on a typewriter with her feet. It was your typical feel-good piece about a disabled person making it in the world. She was well-employed and engaged to be married. Some 62 years after our argument, she was right and I wasn't. She got married. I never did. I got one more story to tell about Cheryl that reflects almost as poorly on me as the one I just told, but it's too funny not to tell. Fast forward about 14 years, and I'm in my first semester college physics class at IUPUI. My instructor was a wonderful educator, Professor Emeritus Golden Flake. Yes, somewhere along the way, Mr. and Mrs. Flake actually decide to name their little boy Golden. Professor Flake's motto was, Physics is fun, and he spelled fun, P-H-U-N. One day he was lecturing about the conservation of rotational momentum. He explained, Did you ever wonder why you swing your arms when you walk or run? Well, having done neither, although I'd observed the same, I was still curious. He continued, It's because when you put one foot forward and your other foot goes backwards, your hip and your entire lower body twist. In order to keep from rotheling, you have to swing your arms in the opposite direction to absorb that rotational energy. I turned to my friend Mike Gregory. I said, Eureka, that finally explains Cheryl. To which he replied, what, who? Later when I had time, I told him about Cheryl and her disability. I explained that when she became a teenager, what God had denied her in the way of limbs, he more than extra made up for in her ample bosom. The poor girl, although she kept her bra straps extremely tight, whenever she walked, her boobs bounced all over the place. I really felt sorry for her. I told Mike, but now I understand why. All of that rotational momentum had to go somewhere, and she couldn't swing her arms, so it went into her, Mike interrupted me, coupled harmonic oscillators. Yeah, you can call them that. Mike went on to tell me about a book of humorous essays he found in the library. It was titled, Stress Analysis of a Strapless Evening Gown. It was a spoof of scientific journal papers in which they applied rigorous engineering and scientific disciplines to ordinary events. The title of the book was the same as the lead essay. It explained in extreme engineering detail, complete with force vector diagrams, what it takes to avoid a wardrobe malfunction in a strapless evening gown. Mike suggested if they ever did a volume two, I should submit a paper about my kindergarten girlfriend. I admit, the whole story is pretty misogynistic, but hey, we were a couple of 19-year-old college kids. What do you expect? We were obsessed with boobs. By the way, I found that book on Amazon while preparing this podcast. I couldn't resist the nostalgia. I ordered a used paperback copy for 10 bucks. In our next episode, we'll continue the saga of my school days at Robert's School. And somewhere along the way, I'll give a reading of my award-winning article I wrote about my experiences there. If you find this podcast educational, entertaining, enlightening, or even inspiring, consider sponsoring me on Patreon for just $5 a month. You'll get early access to the podcast and any other benefits I might come up with down the road. 
It's not that I'm desperate for money, but hey, a little extra income can always help. As always, a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters. Your support means more to me than I can possibly express. And even if you can't provide financial support, please, please, please post links and share this podcast on social media so I can grow my audience. I'll see you next week as we continue contemplating a life. Until then, fly safe.